Good morning and welcome to today's webinar. We're so glad you can join us. My name is Amy Goal, the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, which is providing today's program. This is the second webinar in our series focused on the fact what science teaches us about alcohol, vaping, and marijuana. Today's program is vaping, finding your way through the cloud. A few pieces of information before we get started. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Please complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. Be sure to note on your survey if you would like the ADC or nursing credits. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the webinar broadcast. This program is being recorded and will be available on the partnership's YouTube channel until June 10th, 2020, 2022. We will be muting all attendees' microphones during the presentation, but we would love to hear from you. Please write questions in the question box, and our speaker will respond to as many as possible at the conclusion of the program. And now here is Gisela Lowey, Partnership Perinatal Addiction Community Education Coordinator, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, everyone. So I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Silikov, who's a Turner professor at NYU Grossman School of Medicine, has over 25 years of experience in toxicology and environmental health. Her scientific research over the last several decades have focused on the use of toxicology of inhaled single and complex mixtures of particulate air pollutants and smokeless and combustible products from cigarettes, biomass burning, and diesel exhaust. Her early work in inhalation toxicology focused on the effects of inhaled air pollutants on the pulmonary immune response in rotten models. She has over 150 publications in toxicology and environmental health and has served on several local federal and international committees and advisory boards that have led to policy changes and revised regulations on the impact of all air pollutants. In addition to a very active research program, Dr. Selikov is a member of the Department of Environmental Medicine, graduate steering committee, and has mentored over 50 doctoral and master students. She's also the director at NYU Center for Investigational Environment, Health, Community Engagement Corps for over 14 years. Her community partners include in New Jersey based Native Americans tribe who live directly on a 500 acre heavily contaminated waste dump. Residents of Brooklyn living nearby the Kiwanis Canal and Brooklyn Queens Expressway, along with the aging in place in neighborhoods in Garfield and Fairlawn, New Jersey. During the COVID pandemic, she had done several public service announcements for our community partners on understanding COVID and interview on social distancing in urban environment and dispelling the COVID myths. You will find all of this PSA announcement as an add-on on this presentation. Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Judith Selikov, and thank you. Thank you, Giselle. Please let me know at any, any, any point whether you can uh, hear me or not. So I will just assume that you can hear me and I'll just keep rolling along. So Giselle, that was very kind of you, and I, I wanna thank uh, the partnership with for maternal and child health for inviting me to do this. My, my very latest research is on vaping and it's something that I spend a lot of hours thinking about and talking about to different schools, different high schools, different um, middle schools, 
to parents, to, um, to physicians and clinicians. Uh, it's amazing how much even the most educated people do not know about uh, vaping and e-cigarettes. So I hope that I can bring forward um, many of the questions that you might have been thinking about or having, and uh, I hope I can answer them. And if not in the presentation, then I'll be happy to answer all of all all and any of your questions. So uh, if we're ready, we can begin. So first of all, uh, of course, no presentation starts without a disclaimer. I have no conflict uh, for this activity and there's no commercial support, which is helping with this webinar. Also, I was asked to uh, bring forward uh, what the um, what is needed for a successful completion. And uh, in order to receive your uh, recertification, you have to put in so many hours. Um, and as, uh, as was pointed out at the beginning, a certificate of completion will be sent as an email uh, within one week after the program. The program is being recorded and it'll be available on an on-demand education program until, uh, I think it says 610, but I think that's a little outdated. Okay, so given the fact that most people do not know the ins and outs of, um, of e-cigarettes and the, the myths versus the reality, I thought we'd start with a few questions. And um, my partners over in maternal health will um, see whether they can answer these questions. So, true or false, uh, there are no cancer-causing chemicals in e-cigarettes. I don't know, Giselle. What do you think about that one? Mm, I, I, I think we say there, that is false. Okay, it is false. There, um, it, there are many, as we'll see later in the lecture, there are many cancer-causing chemicals that um, either are directly there or come from the heating up of the chemicals. So e-cigarettes are, true or false, a healthy alternative to the, wrong, to the real thing. I've, I've heard that that's true. Same okay, here, many, I heard that too. Mm -hmm. Many people have heard that. And the answer is actually false. It is not a healthy alternative to the real thing. As you'll see later, uh, well, I won't give away my later, but it is false. <laughs> okay. Um, you, true or false, you can smoke in smoke-free areas, and smoke should be in, in quotations because it's not really smoking. Um, so true or false, you can smoke in smoke-free areas. False. That's false. That is becoming more and more uh, false because uh, in New York and the metropolitan area, um, there are more and more regulations being placed um, in that you cannot smoke in any indoor or you cannot vape indoors and you cannot vape within certain uh, distance of an outdoor environment or a building. It is a cheaper alternative. Of well, course. I would think that would be true because the cigarettes are so expensive. So yes, it is possibly true. Um, it depends which ones you buy, which e-cigs, which devices you buy, how much you buy in terms of what the pod sizes are. Um, Jewel can be quite expensive and, how, and how much you vape. So uh, it, it can be true, yes. Um, no cancer causing tobacco. True or false? Um, I think that's true. It is true. There is no tobacco. However, what people don't realize is that nicotine is a natural product in tobacco. And so this is why the FDA now has control over it because they have traced it down and made it um, to follow tobacco rules. But in the vape products themselves, there is no tobacco. 
there is no fire risk with e-cigarettes. True or false? Hmm. I don't Ooh. know that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I think it's, you light it up, so there has to be some kind of combustible in there. But I'm not sure, you know, obviously fire is a little, well, it's combustible. So I think it's no fire there. I think it's uh, false. Okay, it is false. Um, if you've heard about all the batteries that explode, and once they explode, it is a, a very big fire risk. And that's why they don't allow the batteries from the, um, from the devices onto, um, onto, onto planes or, in car or being stored on planes in the back or in your luggage. Um, no passive smoke to those around us. That's definitely false. That is definitely false. I know from commuting to the city prior to COVID, um, I would walk on the streets and sometimes I would be caught in a puff of aerosols or vape. So um, there's definitely passive, um, passive smoke, passive contaminants. And no bitter aftertaste. That's false too. I think I, I, some of the iPads has some strong taste or is it the other way around? I'm not no. sure. Dr. J Julica, you need to educate us. Okay. That's true, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, it's, it's clear that none of us have vaped. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so there is, uh, depending upon the product that you use, there can be an aftertaste. Um, in it, and it can be bitter. That's why they put a lot of flavors in it, and you'll see in a, uh, the next few slides that there are very flavorful um, flavors added to it. Okay. Interesting. So let's go a little further. Uh, there's been a lot of hype and a lot of marketing that e-cigarettes or e-cigarette devices have been uh, developed to help people stop stop smoking. Um, as a cessation product. So what do you think? Are e-cigarettes successful in helping you quit smoking? I, I don't think so. I, yeah, I would think you were just trading one addiction for another. Well, well people are using it, cigarettes and vaping together. They do both. Are. A oh, lot of do okay. So in fact, cessation rates or stopping was 28% lower who those went who of those who used e-cigarettes compared to those who did not use it. Um, as currently, as as far as the science has taken us to right now, um, e-cigs are actually associated with significantly less quitting among smokers. Mm. In fact, most people are are doing dual use. And once you start vaping, let's say it does uh, take you away from smoking to vaping, um, you, you stick with, the science shows that you stick with vaping a lot longer than you would if you were still smoking and wanted to quit. People don't see the need to want to quit. Interesting. Yeah. So this is the culprit. Um, this is what we call a first generation electronic cigarette when the tobacco companies and the vaping manufacturers first came out first came out they, they said that um excuse me i have to get rid of this um they came out and they said well we probably want them to look like cigarettes because people want to feel to touch um and to think um, consciously and unconsciously that they have a cigarette. So they develop them to look like a cigarette. So this is first generation and you'll see that that has changed dramatically. So for those of you who may not be aware, this is a vape, uh, vape pen. And here at one end you inhale, here's the cartridge that you add your nicotine or as we call it e-juice or e-liquid. Um, here's a the vaporizer, and you put in you have your um, uh, your solvents we'll call them, which are vegetable glycerin and propylene glycol, um, and it allows uh, you to vaporize. Then you of course have your battery, and these are the things that can explode, and it allows you to heat up the e-juice. 
Um, and you can see it's a pretty large battery. So if it exploded, there would be a definite problem. And then I can recall going to concerts um, when before it was uh, illegal or regulated not to be inside with um, vaping devices. And for the product Blue, as it was called, BLU, um, they had a light a blue light and you walked into a concert and all you could see were these blue tips at the end. And so let's now take a look at the um, uh, the nicotine because uh, this is, uh, you guys are dealing with addiction and that's a very important component, but not the only component. So if you look at the number of puffs per, uh, per cigarette and you compare, um, from an e-cig, you're taking about 100, you can get about 100 puffs. Um, from a regular cigarette, about 15. Look at the nicotine levels. Look at the difference, okay? Um, and this is an old, older slide, and like advice on COVID, um, the e-cig the e products are morphing or, or emerging very rapidly. So 24 is what we call a medium smoker or a medium vapor but you can get if you buy a jewel you can go as high as 59 milligrams of nicotine and they also have the super jewel uh, if you want to go into the 60s in terms of milligrams and you can see it's much higher than it is for a regular cigarette and remember 24 is a moderate um, amount of nicotine you can get them in all different ranges and jewel right now has the highest okay so um, nicotine is there, it's a product, it's high. Oops, let's go back. Okay, so usually um, if I'm there with you, um, I will have all of these devices and I let people look at them and hold them. And it's always amazing to me, um, although it shouldn't be because before I started doing research in this area, you know, an e-cig was, okay, I've heard of it, you know, um, but when I actually got out there and started investigating, I realized there was this whole cacophony of different devices. So you have first generation and these are e-cigs and they look like cigarettes. Um, then people wanted higher hits and more hits. So they went to things where it could hold more e-juice called the tank system. And you of course have a bigger battery. Um, personally, I don't even like holding cell phones. So this would be so much larger than my hand actually is. Um, and of course, blue was a first generation and now it came out into the second generation. And then of course you have your jewel or your thumb, uh, thumb device or uh, that looks like a computer uh, thumb drive. And of course, um, a, a new device where it fits very well into your hands. So you may know some of these. I'm sorry I can't offer you some to look at and play with. They're amazing. So just for a jewel, for those of you who don't know, and a lot of students, if you ask them if they vape, they say they'll say no because jewel has now got its own thought, and it's called jeweling. And this is the pod. So in here carries the e-juice and the nicotine, and then you have your battery. And this part. Um, you can, if you take out the pod, you can also use it as a thumb drive or it looks like a thumb drive. Okay, so you may know about these, but um, I wanted to tell you that if you wanted to dress up for an evening out, that you could certainly make your um, e cig device look very um, stylish. And also let you know that um, these same devices are being used for marijuana. And as you can see, one in 11 middle, those are young kids and high school students uh, use, have used pot in these e-cig devices. So um, while you may know about the devices, I thought, and I was shocked, um, luckily I have graduate students and they keep up with everything. Uh, I was shocked to know that um, there are backpacking uh, e-cig devices. So I actually purchased a backpack to show people and it has these tubes 
um, that come down from the backpack and in one of the sides you can hide your uh, your actual device and it's all hooked up and your tube comes down and you vape through there. It's a regular backpack with, with perks. Um, these are some of the other devices that I thought you might not be familiar with. So there are cell phone vapes where you hook it right into, um, into your cell phone. Don't ask me if people want to talk and vape at the same time, I guess. And of course, for those of you who have an office and you want to have your vape right there, you have a desktop charger, you can charge your phone at the same time you, you charge the battery of your um, vaping device. And uh, of course, this is uh, stylish, so you can have a watch. And the watch actually looks like a watch, and it tells the time. Um, and it pops right out of your device that looks like you could be holding a Fitbit type of um, apparatus. And um, on the outside, wear it to school, it's a watch. Take it off, and you can vape through this opening. And then, of course, um, what the latest um, trends are, are hoodie vaping. So you can have um, a sweatshirt and you can have anything you want on it. And out come the tubes um, where you can vape through the tubes and um, in, the, um, in a pocket in the back on the hood is where you have your device. And I know I can't hear you, but I imagine you are all going, oh my gosh, because that's what, whenever I show people this, it's like, oh my God, I didn't know about this. So be aware, if there are any parents out there um, or teachers, you wanna make sure that you're aware of what e-cigarettes, uh, what the devices look like. So question, are e-cigarettes less harmful than regular cigarettes? Where's my team? So I less harmful than regular cigarettes. Absolutely not. Okay. The 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 true answer is maybe. Um, and what people actually think, because you'll get about um, eight thousand more toxic constituents out of cigarettes because of the burning. They burn at a much higher rate, so you get a lot of these incomplete combustion products. However, what people are mistaken is that while they may be less harmful or safer, they are not safe. Okay, next question. What has more nicotine, one jewel pod or one pack of cigarettes? Mm. Where's my Yeah, I'm gonna say, hmm. Uh, one pack of cigarettes. Yeah, aren't they the same? That's what I heard too, Amy. Oh, wow. So one jewel pod, which is what it's called. And if you look down when you're walking through the streets, um, I found one wasn't, I found, I found several in New York, but I also find them, I live in New Jersey, and I found them on the streets. So one pod, one jewel pod equals the same amount of nicotine as one pack of cigarettes. Amazing. Yeah, so, interesting. Yeah. So what's in e-juice? You might have heard of e-juice or e-liquid, and this is, again, a pod. Um, and so what are you actually adding to these devices? So you know that you're adding, usually adding, although you can get it without nicotine, although um, um, the jewels do not come without nicotine. So if you make your own, um, you have nicotine in it and your solvents that I discussed, propylene glycol and glycerol, okay, they act to propel the nicotine into a vapor. And of course, you can have um, flavorants. And if you want flavorants, you've got a choice of 8,000 flavorants and or more and the manufacturers and the tobacco companies and jewel products um they all recognize that we like these things i mean i don't know about you but i you know i certainly can eat a lot of cherries and skittles and these flavors so what they've done is they've 
taken these flavors, brownies, oh, brownies. They've taken these flavors and they've made them into the flavorants for the e-liquid. So you can have exotic ones like um, a firebomb flavor or you can have fruity or a tobacco flavor if you like the tobacco, menthol. And many of, luckily, many of these um, flavorants have been taken off the market um, from depending on the state that you live in. Menthol was just taken off in New York City, so not allowed. And why they've been taken off is um, they're trying, the, the regulators are trying to um, reduce the amount of use, especially by adolescents. And they feel that this is um, inducing more adolescents to use it if they make it a really, if they make it uh, watermelon or bubblicious flavored. So um, what else? People think and, you know, uh, partnerships, uh, regulators, uh, people on the street, whoever is vaping, think that the only problem they really have is nicotine. I mean, we all know the addictive properties of nicotine. But that's not all that's in e-cigarettes. So um, you have a variety of uh, different products. Uh, if it's not the chemicals itself, then it's the products that form. So you have from the battery um, coming off in the aerosol, um, you, might have, you might call it a vape uh, or a vape cloud, but it's really an aerosol. And it contains lots of heavy metals that come from the batteries. Um, the formaldehyde, the acetaldehyde, um, they come from the breakdown products of the propylene glycol and the glycerol. So um, benzene, same thing. And, you know, benzene is a carcinogen causing, um, causing leukemia and other bone marrow product, uh, bone marrow problems. And formaldehyde, you know, who wants to be in bomb when you're still alive? Um, so there's many other products in there. Um, that come from the, um, the heating of the products. So um, back into the question mode, who's vaping? I thought okay. everyone. So, okay, so Go ahead. Go um, ahead. I, I love the enthusiasm. No, this is great. <laughs> okay, so which age group would you say that um, are using the most e-cigarettes or vaping the most? And here's your here's your ranges. Um, so what do you think? Hmm, let me think. Let me think. Uh, I go for 18 and 24. What do you think, Amy? You know, I have to agree, especially with those numbers with the um, the middle school and the high schoolers vaping. So it seems to be um, more younger people who are doing it. Yeah. Okay. You are absolutely right. Yay. Um, the, lar <laughs> the largest group um, in 2017, and while the percentage of them are increasing, the trend of age is not, um, and it's staying the same. So the most are the 18 to 24 year olds, and even younger actually, and then you can see a decrease with age. And when you get to, and I'm not telling you how old I am, um, when you get to the older ages, uh, 55 to 64, all over, you can see that that's not really, uh, not really an issue for us. Thank you. So, yeah, here's some startling numbers for you. 10.5%, uh, that is a huge number of all middle school students, and you know the ages in terms of middle school. I mean, we're talking at 10 year olds. Um, in terms of high school, uh, twice that, more than twice, two and a half fold uh, of high school students are vaping or have vaped in the last 30 days. And look at the numbers as a whole for the US. Five million in 2019, five million high school and middle school kids were vaping and have vaped in the past 30 days. They're considered current vapors. So let's talk about some facts uh, about the youth. Why, why do they do this? So the common misconception um, for youth and adolescents, as well as, as you'll see, other um, vulnerable groups, that the perception is that they're harmless. 
and that they're not going to pose any long-term risks. The problem is that, um, well, first of all, that's false, but adolescents, um, we all, our brains continue to develop until we're about 25 years old. So in the age range that I gave you and younger, uh, what you're inhaling um, and what you're exposed to can alter brain development. And you can, youth can also become more heavily addicted, more easily addicted, I should say, because of the neuronal, um, the nerve cells and how they interact with each other. They're still forming. So you can get many more of those receptors that are, are the nicotine receptors so that you need more and more and more and lower doses um, just don't do it anymore. So what about some of the emerging health risks that we're seeing for these adolescents? Well, we know that right now there's delayed brain development, there's problems in respiratory health, and we know that there's poor um, in the offspring that we're seeing. Um, of vaping uh, exposure early in life or even as adolescents, um, that there's a change in the personality and there's poor impulse control. The fact is that we don't know what's going to happen to adolescents who start very young in life and um, what's going to happen to them in the long term. And we have no idea yet about second and third hand exposure, except that there are second hand and third hand exposure. So um, secondhand exposure, one of the things that people um, like to market it as it's a selling point for them and you can do it anywhere. We know that's false um, because they don't produce smoke. Well, it, puts, it still puts other people at risk. Um, secondhand smoke is a reality and we know from some preliminary findings um, from scientists that there's a similar amount of heavy metals and other substances that are given off in the vape cloud. So because of, um, I, when I talked with uh, Giselle and Amy and, and, um, and the team, um, they said that, you know, there be people who really do need to understand uh, in the audience um, how you can tell that your child or a child, your teacher, your professor, your, uh, your clinician uh, who comes in and says, I don't know, my, my daughter is, she is very secretive. I mean, it's hard to tell with a 16 year old, but because I remember being very secretive, um, but they're always thirsty. I can't keep enough drinks in the house. Um, they, they were, you know, pretty, pretty calm before and now the mood swings are, are Dramatic. So there are a number of, and this one's a good one, desire for spicy or salty foods. So um, there are ways and key, key points to look for if you're wondering if the person is vaping. So one of the things that I, when I talk to um, middle school kids and high school kids, you know, I don't know if you recall, I mean, I certainly recall when I was a teenager or young 20s that I didn't want anybody telling me what I could and could not do. I mean, that just, you know, my friends, yes, um, but not any kind of authority figures. And, and the tobacco company who make, um, who make these vape products, uh, they're the, they know this. And so they advertise and they target um, to, the, uh, to the youngsters and they, they thrive on the independence. And one of the things when you track back in history about the tobacco companies, you realize that they're using the same advertising and marketing ploys that they used back in the 50s to get people to smoke. And the tobacco company, this is, these, are, these pictures are from the 1950s. No, I didn't take them. I got them offline. Um, and everybody was supposed to smoke. You know, if you look back, you'll be amazed to see some doctor advertisements where they, the doctors, the clinicians actually say, I prefer cool because of the menthol. And look at the same things that they're using now for vaping. Okay, so on your way to the bathroom, make sure you take your jewel, um, 
teachers don't see it ahead of time and make sure you know you're familiar with spongebob so um they released many of the memos from the tobacco companies um back you know in, in in the past decade or so when there was a big or two decades ago when there was a big bust on tobacco and they found these memos um that said i don't smoke that blank i reserve that right for the dumb and stupid and it's the same thing so i express to young people that you are indeed being manipulated and this is not a cool act. This is not an independent act. You are being manipulated, but just by different people. So what are some of the risks of vaping? And you're probably familiar with some of them or have heard about some of them like asthma, heart attacks, strokes, pulmonary disease, uh, certain lung injuries. And um, so please know, of course, here you can see again, the same kinds of combustion, uh, not combustion, but the same kinds of products that are released. And if you like the kind with um, uh, buttery flavor, then you're also getting another carcinogen called diacetyl, and it causes what we say as popcorn lung, which you'll see in a minute. Everyone smokes or vapes differently. It's uh, which kind you like how you do it, how you draw, how you blow out. It's, it's varied depending upon age, race, um, and ethnicity. And unlike cigarettes, um, vaping is done by, um, as opposed to lower socioeconomic groups, vaping is something of the upper um, socioeconomic group. So it contrasts in that way. Um, most of the products that happen, most of the mechanisms by which these um, products, the nicotine, the VOCs, the small particles, um, usually cause effects by um, oxidative stress, inflammation, and I study inflammation, and I don't think there's a disease, and if there are clinicians out there, you know that there probably isn't a disease that doesn't... Um, start or exacerbate through inflammation, and of course, um, mutating or changing the DNA. Also, when you buy, we, when we started doing research in the lab, we would buy nicotine, and what we found is very true, is that the concentration or the percentage of nicotine that they tell you is in the uh, e-juice or in the refill solutions are not accurate. So you may think you're getting 24, but in reality, you're getting 36 milligrams. And the FDA um, is trying, it, it's kind of like peddling, peddling, trying to get somewhere, but having to go very slowly. So one of the big acts was in 2016. One of the big acts was in 2016 when the FDA set up the deeming rule um, and that allowed e-cigarettes to be considered the same as tobacco products because it has the same ingredient, nicotine. So what about some of the toxicology? I am a toxicologist, you heard Giselle, and toxicologists are people who study the effects of poisons. Um, I'm an environmental toxicologist, so I study effects of inhaled pollutants, um, water pollution, things that are uh, initiating disease or changing health as a result of things that you find in the environment. And mostly I, I specialize in air pollution and other inhaled pollutants. So one of the big things, just to follow up, um, there's a study, you have to understand that e-cigs only came out, the marketing, even though they were um, first defined in China, they were only marketed they were only marketed here in starting in 2007. So unlike cigarettes that really came about in the 1930s in high high use, um, we only have you know a little uh, more than a decade to really study. So the science is behind. So some of the things that we do know, however, is um, inflammation is a is a big um, underlying mechanism by which you get um, toxic toxicity. And these are just um, um, a, a bunch of different pathways within the cell um, that brings on inflammation. So we see when there are these activated 
signals in the cell that they're going to lead to inflammation. We know that um, the vape, um, the juice, and the um, what's exhaled um, can bring about immune suppression or make you more susceptible to um, infections. And that's why there's been a link recently with um, COVID and people who vape or smoke cigarettes. Um, and we, we know we have some evidence that prolonged exposure, I mean, some of these people, some of these kids start vaping at around 10 or 9, and of course they continue. Um, and we know that some of the constituents that are, are either there or form as a product um, can cause inflammation, can cause asthma, um, and, and or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, there is some evidence from actually from our department. Um, Dr. Tang um, had data in animals, which basically he showed that e-cigarette smoke or e-cigarette um, aerosols can be carcinogenic in animals. And it changes some of the products that come out um, from the vapor from the products can uh, cause the DNA in the nucleus of the cell to be damaged. And usually in our cells, we can repair damage by certain enzymes. But if you don't have the ability to repair the DNA damage, then what happens is you can result in cancer cells being formed and ultimately cancer. And he has shown this in an animal model. So um, we need to do further studies in this area. What about in human studies? What are some of the health effects, whether it's short-term or long-term long effects? So what you're seeing here um, in terms of short-term effects, you'll have coughing and choking. Um, some people it makes them very nauseous. Um, dizziness occurs. Um, your long-term effects can really change your, your gums uh, and your teeth. And um, you can, uh, there's some evidence showing cataracts, um, insomnia, you know, you're getting a lot of nicotine. And because you have suppressed immune response, you're also likely to develop pneumonia. So as I said, there is a disease that's very well linked right now with um, vaping and it's called popcorn lung. And the reason for that is uh, the diacetyl. So this has a very um, interesting history, popcorn lung. So people, I don't know how many of you eat um, microwave popcorn, um, but you shouldn't be opening it under your nose and or near your mouth. And the reason for this is, although they have taken it out now, um, the buttery flavored popcorn releases diacetyl um, from the popcorn as it's microwave. And when you open it, you get this huge hit of the diacetyl. And they found that the manufacturers and the companies that make this microwave popcorn were developing what we call popcorn lung. And it has a, another name, it's constrictive bronchiolitis. So we're, we're pretty certain that popcorn lung, although caused by many other things, can also is associated with vaping. And I probably don't have to tell you about um, before COVID, we had Evali, which is um, many, many uh, adolescents um, and children were developing um, lung injuries that many died. And that's Evali is the name that was given to it, but it's e-cig or vaping associated lung injury. And it has certain symptoms that are associated with it. Um, the, the kids would start to cough a lot. They had a lot of difficulty breathing. Uh, Evali is a pneumonia. So you're going to see the same things uh, that you would with pneumonia or that you would with COVID. Um, fever, chills, weight loss. Um, some of the kids um, recovered very quickly and um, others um, died uh, after being ventilated. So um, unfortunately, this is what happens, and you can see that the 18 to 24 year olds were the most uh, were the most affected, and 
Um, they could not breathe on their own. And as I said, many, many died. This happened primarily in the US. Um, it wasn't such a big problem in the EU or any other European countries. And here you can see the histology. Um, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and it shows lots of the little spots are actually immune cells and lots and lots of inflammation in the lungs. So I wouldn't recommend it. So what caused this? Well, there is some information and evidence that um, it might be associated with THC, which is um, in marijuana. It's the hallucinogenic in marijuana, or it could be vitamin E. Um, because they use that as a dissolving, a dissolvent for um, THC. And, but the, the true answer is, you know, people say, well, um, it might be, you know, we've used uh, vitamin E on our skin and nothing's happened. And so why should this be a problem? So one of the things that's really important, people say that about propylene glycol, you know, it's been approved, generally regarded as safe by the FDA, but please understand that the exposure route that you use to take in this cinnamon, to take in these, um, these watermelon flavors, to take in vitamin E, they've only been studied and approved based on the exposure route. So we're all used to sucking on cinnamon candy, it helps relieve nausea. We're all used to rubbing vitamin E on our skin. But when you inhale it, we don't know. So let's, let's uh, switch gears a little bit, but still follow on the same thread. So not everyone, we are all unique individuals. We all have different genetics. We all have, sure, we have some of this, a lot of the same, but we all have unique um, genetics in terms of that which is expressed. Um, we all come from different environments. We all deal with things differently. So there are different degrees of susceptibility. And some people may respond one way, other people another way. Um, and so, so here's a, kind of a condensed list of some of those more susceptible or vulnerable populations. We all know that the elderly um, are considerably, because of the comorbidities, you know, you're actually seeing this. You're going to hear things that are actually very um, associated or closely linked right now with COVID. So these are the same vulnerable populations. Native Americans, we're finding out that have uh, different, what we call polymorphisms in their genes. So while white Americans can metabolize certain things and get rid of them, Native Americans cannot. Um, we're, we're learning now uh, in terms of COVID that it's the minority populations, um, the marginalized populations that have a much higher incidence of COVID. Um, and this happens for in general. Uh, children, of course, are much more vulnerable to toxicants and toxic agents. And of course, and the thing that I'm going to spend a little more time on right now is pregnant women in the fetus, very vulnerable populations to all kinds of toxicants. So let's talk about some of the startling facts that I didn't know about uh, until putting this together and um, things that people think. So there was a survey done, and I think it was in 2018, um, by the Center for Disease Control. And one in 15 pregnant women use e-cigs around the time of pregnancy. So that's either before, during, or, or late in stage, or after, okay? That's a lot. I mean, we're talking about a large population of people. So 7% of all pregnant women in the US vape. Um, and they're not very aware of what they're doing. So 61% of those pregnant women who vape um, knew that it was addictive, um, but 43%, which I think is a very large value, reported not knowing that most e-cigarettes contain, excuse me, contain nicotine. I mean, that's a huge, that's almost half of all the women that do this. You have no idea that there's nicotine in there. 
And 69% um, of the population that they tested viewed e-cigarettes as a moderate or minor health hazard. But 20% viewed them as having no health hazard at all. So we have to do something about this. Um, the CDC in 2016 and the Surgeon General said that e-cigarettes are not safe for pregnant women and they should not, they should not vape. Um, we recognize that there's, um, because of the nicotine, even just looking at nicotine, it rapidly crosses the placenta and it can bring about changes in neurodevelopment of the fetus. Even if you do not have nicotine, that there are many other chemicals that I described that can bring about toxic effects in the fetus and the offspring. And um, unfortunately, people want to believe what they want to believe. When I'm when I'm giving talks on COVID and all, I, I tell people there are lots of myths, and don't listen to Twitter and don't listen to uh, what your friends are putting on Facebook, and you have to really listen to the science, um, but um, they are still, even though we admit that we don't know about pregnant smokers, they're still using it as a harm reduction strategy and even doctors, which you'll see in a minute. We have no idea if the, if the risk or the benefit, um, which one outweighs the other. If it were me, and I were pregnant and I would take a very conservative approach and just say the risk is higher than the benefit. But of course, I'm not a smoker, so I don't understand the addiction component of it. So, you know, we all go, especially pregnant women, um, you see a clinician, an OBGYN quite a bit, you know, for different monitoring and everything. And um, so there was surveys done that asked the clinicians, what do you think? And 13% 13, 13 said e-cigarettes were free of harm. This was 2016. Hopefully we've come a longer way. 29% believe that e-cigs had an adverse effect but were less harmful than smoking. 13% uh, indicated that e-cigs um, and combustible tobacco cigarettes were equally harmful. But the thing that gets to me is that 36% indicated they didn't know. So if they don't know, what are they going to say? What are they going to tell you? You know, um, we rely on these particular people. So I think we need to make sure that everyone is informed. So I'm going to um, tell you now about, um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of deep science at all. I'm just going to give you the highlights. Um, but in our lab, we there are a lot of things that you can't do with humans. You know, they don't like to be poked and prodded. They don't like to have their spleen removed for no reason. They don't have to, they don't like to have bronchoscopies and have their lungs looked at for no reason. So a toxicologist often rely on rodent models to do this. And we ask the question, um, we ask the question of whether we thought in animals, whether e-cigarettes, and we use blue in this case, um, whether it had nicotine or, or didn't, would change neurodevelopment, produce inflammation in the brain, and how long would it last? And with those animals, with those offspring of prenatally exposed, um, or, or moms that are exposed during pregnancy in this case, how would the offspring respond many months later? So um, we, we said, we know that smoking, we know has a, has an effect on the fetal, um, the child, and there's lots of neurobehavioral changes and neurology that changes in smoking um, in a child whose mom smoked either um, during or after, and that in general, there's all of these changes that occur. You get a general decrease in intellectual ability. We know this with smoking. Um, we get um, more conduct disorders, more behavioral disorders. There's an ADHD component. So knowing this, we said, what if we follow this pattern and we do the same thing, only we expose these animals, these mice, to um, aerosols, vapors. And interestingly, we found um, that if you look 
if you look at gene changes in the brain and you take those gene genetic changes in the brain and you map them out and you look for diseases that may arise as a result of these changes in the genes, that these behaviors, these changes, like changes in learning, emotional behavior, hyperactive behavior, changes in memory, all the things that you would see with cigarette smoking in the offspring, you also see these potential changes um, following um, vaping during pregnancy in the offspring. So um, to put that another way is that um, many of the same outcomes, many of the same genes that are changed by smoking during pregnancy or secondarily during lactation that are changed like changes in learning, changes in memory, that the same, the same genes and the same pathways are changed from prenatal exposure to vape aerosol. So not much difference there. What about inflammation in the brain? And we know that inflammation in the brain can lead to diseases like schizophrenia, Alzheimer's diseases, they're, Alzheimer's disease, they're all, they're linked, okay, depressive disorder. So what about inflammation in the brain? And there's a specific part of the brain that we looked at, which is called the hippocampus. And we look to see if using a marker, okay, um, whether or not uh, this marker of inflammation was increased in our offspring. And so here is your control level. Of course, you're gonna have some of this, we call it IBA1 enhanced, but if you look at um, the offspring without nicotine, this is prenatal exposure, to PGVG, as we call it, without flavoring, without nicotine, you can see that there's even more inflammation. And here's a picture that once you stain for this biological marker, and again, this marker is an indicator of inflammation in the brain. And if you look, you can see that looking at the red, you can see that there's more of these cells that are lighting up in the offspring of mothers who were, um, who were exposed to vaping aerosols without nicotine. So as I said, we went on to look at, um, did this last? So we went to see what are some of the behavioral characteristics. Three months after being exposed prenatally, what about are they exhibiting behavioral changes that could be linked to um, some of the changes that I showed you in the brain? So if we looked at um, animals that were offspring that were adult because um, uh, the life of a mouse is usually about um, two and a half to three years depending on the strain of the mouse. And so they age at a lot, a lot more rapidly. So a four month old um, mouse is equivalent to about a 25 or 30 year old uh, person. And what we can see just again overall is that even without nicotine, just the vehicle, just the PGVG, the juice, okay, without nicotine, that these animals, whether it be it a male or a female, that they had, they were much more jumpy. And what that means is more activity, more they jump more times in a given amount of time than the controls. So they were very, you could say hyper. hyper. And again, this is four months. So this is at least um, two months following their exposures, two or three months. And they run faster and they move more. And so if you see where I'm going, you know, we're talking about, again, even without nicotine, um, what we're talking about is a hyper-like uh, scenario that is seen well after exposures. Interestingly, um, there's been some speculation that e-cigarettes can lead to um, obesity later in life. Um, and in, our, this, in another animal study, we saw that um, 
that there were there's a higher body mass, okay, in um, at 12 weeks and in 21 days. Um, when there's an exposure, here you can see it primarily in females, when they're exposed with nicotine, okay? So 12 weeks after exposure prenatally, these, these offspring had a higher body mass. Are we looking at obesity later in life? Who knows? So um, to wrap up, and to give you, so we all have time for questions. Here are some of the take home messages that I'd like you to remember. Um, that number one, it doesn't, you don't have to have nicotine to bring about these changes in neurodevelopment. And they're different whether you're a male and a female. That the changes in genes that you see lead to some changes in, um, that are identical to those seen with um, smoking. Um, that the uh, adult offspring will have and could have the same outcomes, um, the adverse health outcomes that cigarette smokers have. The behavioral changes that we see in these offspring, in these adult offspring, are very similar to what you might see in um, ADHD. And we think we've made a compelling case and that there's enough science out there that women should not vape during pregnancy. So, of course, I'd like to acknowledge no, no man, no woman is an island. And um, I had a lot of help and a lot of collaborators. The, the one question I'll leave you with is, this product was developed. Um, was it fact or fiction? It's basically a vape toy for young children. And the answer to that is maybe uh, not forever. So thank you very much. And I'll take any questions. That was, that was terrific, Dr. Zelikoff. Thank you so much. Um, just a reminder to those on the call that the question box is still open, so please feel free to continue to submit your questions. Giselle, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, sure, Amy. Thank you so much, Dr. Selikov. This was so informative. And the first question that we have in the box is um, going referring back to the relationship of COVID-19 between smoking and vaping, um, do you see a relationship between those two, smoking and vaping? Mm -hmm. um, so this is a, a new disease. You know, it, it's emerging, um, and we know we know two things right now. Um, we know that there's a relationship between air pollution and COVID. And we're seeing a relationship emerge between smokers and um, and the higher risk for um, for COVID. And it's starting to emerge now. And more and more um, scientists are addressing the question: If you compromise the pulmonary system, if you injure the system, like you see with Ebola then it makes sense that you will see the same thing with susceptibility to injury, to injury and to immune system suppression with vaping. So some, some papers have come out, but we're still on, on our, our mission to find them. But if one had to, as a scientist, if I just had to tell you what my common sense tells me, it's going to tell me that anything that you're exposed to that can compromise the immune system and make make it more susceptible to infectious agents is going to put you at greater risk. So right now, the CDC is recommending that you do not smoke and you do not vape. Thank you, Dr. Judy. The second question that I have is, um, do you think banning of flavors will reduce use by adolescents? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, I, I do agree with the banning. Um, 
I think that 8,000 flavors are ridiculous. I think that fudge brownie flavoring and all that, I, if you look at who's doing what, you'll see that most of the flavors are used by the adolescents. So in your 24, your 35 year olds that are vaping, and your certainly your 40 year olds, your 30 year olds, they are not vaping with flavors. They're vaping with menthol or tobacco flavors. So if you just go by the numbers, it would make sense that if you remove some of these flavorants, um, especially those like cinnamon, which have been found to be very toxic to the lung, um, if you remove some of these, then you might have a decrease. But I think that you know adolescents and young adults are very resourceful. And I also know that they're making things at home. Um, and so I was sitting on the path one day going into the city and these two women were, I was sitting and they were standing next to me. And the one woman said, she, they were in their twenties. And she said, for my husband's birthday, I got him a whole bunch of different e-juices um, because he makes his own, our own vapes in his laboratory. Wow. So the answer to that question is, I think it could have an impact. I don't think it can cause any harm to remove it, but we'll have to see about the numbers. Thank you, Dr. So piggybacking on that question, I have one coming through the chat box. Um, what do you think would be the best way to deter adolescents from stopping youth? So um, one of the reasons that I showed you, you know, how to t how to tell whether a child or your child or whatever is vaping, um, and the other reasons I showed you many of the devices, I feel that we have to be informed, and we have to, you know, when kids are 10, 11 years old, hopefully they have they are still, you know, responding to parental. Um, authority in some way and so I, I think we have to be smarter than them and that's going to take some some doing but there was a video on YouTube which I, I knew my talk was long and I didn't want to extend it anymore but they had a, a YouTube video where they had teachers come in they they gave these uh, devices some of the ones that I showed you and other ones I didn't show you an, an e-pen, which writes on one side and um, is a pen on one side and a vaping device on the other. So there's lots and lots of them. And they had the teachers go through and they left these devices out in plain sight. And out of the 30 students uh, who had them, they only identified about seven. And wow. so I, one thing, and then they had parents come in and they did even worse. So I, I think you have to know when your child's vaping. I don't think we had a meeting on this. And all the flyers, um, what we decided is that all the flyers that are out there, all the infographics that are out there, all the commercials that are out there, they're not having an effect. And, you know, I remember being 20 and 16, and I wasn't about to listen. You know, all this can happen to others, but not to me. Um, so what we came up with is that I think that more like the, the picture that I showed you of the man who has Ivali, the young man who has Ivali, I think the message has to come from their peers. And so I think that the message has to come from um, the peers who maybe can help us write advertisements, um, come from people who like this young man who had Ivali. You know, the message has to be different and you have to target your community. And if the, if you're working with 10 to 15 year olds or or nine to 13 year olds, you have to hit them where they're going to listen. And so that's why A is awareness, B is discussion. Um, and if you can have one in a group say, I'm not doing that, that stuff then they will listen. I've had students come up to me, young, young kids, middle school, and say, you are right, Dr. Z. I'm, I'm not doing this and I'm gonna tell my friends. And if you can just get one, you know, 
um, and the and the message of being manipulated. Oh, students, uh, kids hate to feel that someone is controlling their life. Hmm. So we have to do different messaging, and we have to um, understand and be aware of what it is. Thank you, Dr. Judith. Um, I have another question uh, that I, it says, what health effects besides lung injury do you think will be seen in the future? Okay. Well, I think it's going to follow the path of, um, of cigarette smoking because in the, in the vape aerosol, you do have, as I said, cancer causing agents. You do have things like lead. You're going to, you, you have things like uh, carcinogens like cadmium, things that are coming off the battery. You're having things like formaldehyde, which we know is a nasal carcinogen. You're having, so you're having a lot of, uh, you have um, reproductive toxicants in there. You see that there's neurotoxicity that can occur. So I think what you're going to see in the future besides lung injury is you're going to see cardiovascular injury, you know that there's going to be neurological changes because we, we know we're seeing that there's um, ADHD like behavior. We're seeing that there's mood changes in these kids. So um, you're so the organ systems that are going to be impacted, you know, are things like the brain that are changed, their personalities are changed, the depression, anxiety. Um, you're going, as I said, cardiovascular because you have a lot of the same components that are cardiotoxicants, as we call them, toxic agents that cause changes in the in the structure and function of heart cells. Um, so I, I and you're definitely producing inflammation. And if you look at the underlying, which is inflammation, every disease that as I said, er, almost any disease you can think of, including wrinkles, are mediated by inflammation. So inflammation is a two-edged sword. On the one side, it helps you get rid of infections. So inflammation is when the body's immune system attacks an infectious agent, a virus, a bacteria, whatever. And, um, you know, people uh, who are, have a normal immune response, they're going to get rid of things. Um, but, um, those, so inflammation can be good, but inflammation is also, as you're seeing with COVID right now, a lot of the kids are getting this massive systemic inflammatory response and they're winding up in the hospital and on ventilators. So a little inflammation is good. A lot is not good. If inflammation underlies things, not only associated with the lung, but as I said, with the brain and inflammation in the brain underlies diseases like depression and schizophrenia and also Alzheimer's. So I think you're going to see a lot of different um, um, chronic illnesses from long-term vapors. Thank you, Dr. Judith. I have a question um, from Antoinette. Has there been any research on the electronic Hookah. Is this included <laughs> in the vape research? <laughs> so hookah can be, hookah is even closer. Thank you for that question because we do a lot of research with hookah too. Um, and it's a very, very big social and cultural um, um, device. So hookah um, is even, gives you products that are even closer to those which you find in cigarette smoke. So number one, there are hookah pens. So hookah now looks like uh, vaping devices. So they've put hookah or shisha, as it's also called, um, into vape pens. So people can do marijuana in these vaping devices and people can do hookah. So, when, if you know anything about hookah and hookah bars and everything, um, so you have this large hookah device, this lar large water pipe, and you use um, charcoal and you burn the charcoal. And then um, you have these vaping or 
tubes that you suck through and hopefully change the mouthpiece. Um, but what you're getting, the first hit that you get from hookah is like a dizzy or high. And what that is, is carbon monoxide. So you are actually burning charcoal. So unlike vaping, and the reason that vaping is less harmful than cigarette smoking, is you're not burning. With hookah, you're burning. So all of the products that you're, incomplete combustion products that you're getting, like all these carcinogens and these reproductive toxicants, um, all these chemicals, all these metals, all these um, uh, things that cause heart disease, all these chemicals are coming out from breathing out from the, um, from the hookah. And my colleague from NYU Department of Environmental Medicine, he went into a number of hookah bars. He had money from NIH to study um, hookah bars. And in New York City, the hookah bars are not allowed to have um, tobacco in the shisha. They must be tobacco free. So one thing, and there they are, these two mid, older than middle-aged guys walking in with backpacks that have tubes coming out of them so they can capture the air. And um, with gray hair and gray beards, and you know, I understand it was a sight. Um, and they captured the air and found, number one, that in nine out of 11 hookah bars in the boroughs and in Manhattan had nicotine in the air. And what that means is tobacco. Um, so they got closed down actually. And the other thing they did was they took these hookah bar workers and who have to be there with all of this secondhand uh, hookah smoke and they tested um, hypertension and they tested, you know, like high blood pressure and they tested um, uh, inflammation on these, on these hookah bar workers. And they published it. I can get you that publication if you want. Um, and demonstrated that all of these workers had um, elevations in their blood pressure, inflammation, um, systemic inflammation, lots of different um, inflammatory markers in their blood, um, and of course, coughing and other symptoms. So, hookah is, you know, if I had to rate them, I'd put cigarette smoke, hookah smoke, and then aerosols. And the air, the vaping aerosols is only last because we know less about it. Wow, that's really amazing. Thank you for that information. I have a question. It says, uh, when, it, when I'm starting school again, should I get vaccinated for the flu if using e-cigarettes or vaping products? I'm sorry, again, please. I didn't quite understand that. Sure. Should I get vaccinated? Is it a good idea to get vaccinated for the flu even if I'm using cigarettes or vaping products? Yes. Absolutely, no question. Um, the flu, even if you're using cigarettes or vaping products, which will diminish your immunity, um, the, without the vaccination, you are even 10 times higher in risk to get the flu. So yes, that should not stop you. In fact, if anyone needs it more, it's the vapors and the smokers and the hookah users. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you know what policies are in place to safeguard the targeting in the marketing uh, to the children from these products? Yeah, so we've put, um, or not we, um, but they have, because of the deeming rule and modifications to the rule, um, there is now an age limitation of buying um, of 21, moved from 18 to 21. Let me let me tell you something from um, going on the internet. So in order to buy these products um, to show people, definitely not to use, I'm not using, um, to show people, um, we went on the internet and we went to these vaping sites. And I wouldn't recommend it because now all I do is get uh, information and mm -hmm. questions and marketed to work. And in order to buy vape juice, let's say, or a vape pen, um, or the vape watch. All you have to say is you have to fill out some boxes that says you're not a robot, that says I guarantee that I'm over 21, 
and then then you're on and then you can order whatever you want so um yes the the sales are limited uh, but the internet's still there and um not as um not as strict or does not scrutinize as much um and i i think that you know oh the other thing that's interesting is if you smoke or even if you've ever bought cigarettes for someone or whatever you know I'll ask you, what's on the side of the package? Good question. I don't know if I've ever seen a package. <laughs> I guess it has a warning on it. Yes, it has a warning. And is that uh, is that right up that warning? Is that for you know for anyone who might have seen a pack of cigarettes? Is it large or small? Well, I think right now they is large. I think I seen something that says smoking is gonna kill you. I'm not quite sure, but I think it's large. It used to be small, but now it's large. Right, because agencies and foundations have pushed the tobacco industry um, into more and more warnings and more graphic warnings. And if you look at the TV and you see commercials, they they know now that just saying don't smoke is not an answer so what do they show they show people in breathing tubes they show young people they show older people with um um with what do you call it with um vocal cords removed and talking through a machine but in comparison the vape products have tiny warnings that if you're my age um you have to put on your glasses to even see so there's no strong warnings. What they say, if you take the time to read and you can say it, is that nicotine is an addictive substance. That's all we have right now. So um, we need much harder regulation and more scrutiny and more follow-up and more enforcement. And we have to be able to stay ahead of the curve. When I say us, I mean the adults. We have to know, you know, we all snuck candy when we were younger and everything else, but, you know, our parents knew what to look for. Um, we have to know what to look for. And, and we have to talk to the adolescents and the students and whatever in a way that they understand. And a way that they want to say, oh my God, you know, I mean, if I never smoked in my life, I've never bought cigarettes, I've never been around, I, I've hated it since, because my parents smoked, so I hated it. But if someone had told me that I would get wrinkled, I might have really thought about it. <laughs> you have to appeal to the things that are going to appeal to you, or that, um, okay, so we've done some studies with cigarettes and mice, and I, I didn't show some of these studies. And we found that prenatal would reduce the sperm count in the offspring, in the male offspring. Well, if you want to talk to a high school person and you show them this data, that's something that may appeal to them, okay? So it actually changed in New York. It helped to change the regulations in New York City to um, closing down some of the hookah bars because we showed it for that too. And they took it into account when they set up regulations for New York State. So, you know, nobody thinks they're gonna age, you know, but again, if somebody had told me I would have gotten melanoma because I was sitting in the sun when I was 17, um, you know, I wish I had known. So. Thank you, doctor. Um, I have another question here. It says, how does marijuana use in the electronic cigarettes or vaping products affect the youth? Well, that's a, a again, these are all really great questions. Um, so number one, they can, if you mean health wise, uh, let me start with it's easier to hide. Okay. So you can you can put it in you know uh, in your necklace. You can put it in a pen. Uh, you can put it anywhere. You can put e-juice. You can put marijuana, and it's going to have THC. Now, 
you're not burning it, so you're not getting as many incomplete combustion products, but you're getting THC. And we know that THC, as well as some of the products that are being released, are going to go directly to the brain. And um, they're going to affect the same way that um, smoking uh, THC is going to give you the same kind of health effect. You're just minimizing some of the combustion products. In other words, when you heat something at a very high temperature, you're going to get like carbon, like from charcoal. You're going to get all of those um, those things that can cause cancer, like benzoapyrene. Or um, a graphic example of that is if you um, I don't know how many people like to barbecue, but when I barbecue. Um, no matter what it is, because I don't eat beef, but if I barbecue, you know, you get this black, um, black stuff on top. And that's what a lot of people like. And they like, but what it really is, is it's a cancer causing agent called benzoapyrene. So from burning charcoal, like with hookah, um, but with vaping and vaping marijuana, you're not going to get some of those same products, but you are still going to get the TA and you're going to get some of the bio the, the breakdown products of THC and the solvent you're not just using THC alone you're using marijuana juice thank you dr. Judith and and to go with that we have a question about um, CBD and vape product has there been research done on that, particularly since CBD has been marketed as an alternative uh, uh, for uh, relieving pain or stress and anxiety. Okay. Yeah, I have a kind of a platform on that, but um, I will switch over to my, my, um, my scientist hat. So, uh, <laughs> so my platform on that is that it's uh, a, a, a steak oil. For those of you in the audience or participants um, or who are older uh, than you know 28 um, or 35, you may remember back or even seen old pictures where this guy comes up as a vendor and he says, it's a cure-all. Mrs. Jenny's tonic will cure everything. And I kind of think that that's what CBD oil is. So mm -hmm. CBD oil, although I do know it has health implications, CBD oil is, first of all, supposedly without THC. So CBD is regulated and um, it, there's an allowable amount of the hallucinogenic THC in it, but it's supposed to be below which causes any kind of um, effects. But please know that when you're taking CBD oil orally or inhaling it, that you are getting some small bit of THC, below which they say does not cause any problem. CBD oil is being used um, to rub on as an ointment and it really, it penetrates, so it penetrates through the epidermis and the dermis and it, it's been known to help. Um, CBD oil for inhaling, there really isn't enough studies out right now um, to show, as I said, the route of exposure, how you do it, whether it's ingesting it or dermally rubbing it or inhaling it or injecting it, all produces different effects because it goes through the body differently. So I know they're recommending CBD. I, I checked out all the internet sites. Um, and I was surprised by it. Um, I, I know they're giving it early in pills. I would say as far as inhaling it, I question that. Um, there's not any studies on inhaling, you know, no true sound scientific studies on it at this point for inhaling. Uh, if you find that it helps arthritis and you, you dermally, you get, go through dermal absorption, or if you find that you're on an oral dose um, and you find that it helps you, just remember that there's not enough science behind it to really address the important question. And I would limit any kind of vaping of it at this time. Thank you. Um, Giselle, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, sure. Um, 
start to Judith, um, people wanted to know why do you think besides um, the juicing or the, I guess the, the, you know, fruity flavors that, you know, they sell vaping on, why do you think it's so popular in the middle school and the high school adolescents or the high school students? Why do you think vaping is so popular besides having those um, increase of flavoring products on it? Why, what else do you think the kids, you know, why is this so popular among them? It's cool. It's cool to do. You know, going back generationally, um, I, as I said, I never smoked, but my sister did. And it was cool. The high school kids would go out. You know, history repeats itself. The high school kids who smoke and all hang out together. And um, it was a social group. And the same thing, you can see the same thing with, um, with hookah. You know, hookah bars. Where are the hookah bars? The hookah bars are around the university. Because college students go out on Saturday night and they eat together and they, they do hookah together. It's a social more and the same thing is true now with with vaping i mean they're making all these cool looking devices um and they're um you do get a hit you get a hit from it you feel you know just like any other nicotine you get a, you know why do people why do people smoke still because you get a feel good hit you get the release of dopamine feel good hormone you know, you, you get all this, you get the nicotine, you get the uh, receptors in the brain turning on and releasing all kinds of neurotransmitters that say, wow, I feel good. Um, and so, you know, there are really physiological, uh, physiological changes that contribute to it. But why are the young people doing it? Because they're in the in crowd. They are getting away with something. They're not, um, they're disobeying parents, authority figures. Um, it's the cool kids who hang out in the bathroom and vape uh, because there's no smell, um, or unless it's a fruity smell. Um, and I, I think it's a, it's a big social, big social thing. And we've all had it. If you look at what generation you're in, you, we've all had it, you know, if we're cheerleaders, then we're in a social group. If we're in a vaping group, then we have all these friends who vape. It's very social based. Thank you, Dr. Judith. And that's all I have on my end, uh, Amy. I have, yeah, I have one more, and this is kind of a, a different um, end of the spectrum. But has there been any research on um, vaping and breastfeeding? Specifically, do the um, toxins uh, go into the breast milk? Yes. I'm afraid, I'm afraid to say yes. Um, I'm afraid I have to say yes. So many of them that I showed you on the slides, they absolutely not just go through the placenta, um, but they also are, um, they also are, some of them are what we call lip soluble. And so the breast is made up of lots of fat, you know, the mammary glands. And so many of these products, um, when we say lipophilic means that they like to be in fat. They like to be where the lipids, where the fats are. And so they find their way, these chemicals find their way into, um, into the um, breast milk or the lactate, during lactation. So um, vaping during pregnancy, during lactation is um, unadvisable. And even afterwards, People, people will stick with it and say, oh, my child is just, you know, oh, my child is born and they're only three months old. And also, if it's not you vaping, but someone, a significant other who lives in the house with you, secondhand vape. Thank you. And that's all we have time to answer today. Again, I want to thank um, Dr. Zelikoff. I learned so much today and it's been great. Uh, listening to you and interacting with you. I'd like to thank um, our audience. We had over 100 people at the webinar today. And I'd also thank, like to thank Laura Hall, who's handling the technical back end of the program, as well as to uh, Gisela Lowy, who co-hosted co with me today. 
A reminder that in about an hour, you will receive an email with a link to a post-program evaluation. Please uh, take the time to complete the evaluation and uh, make sure that you indicate uh, the type of credit that you uh, would like, CADC or nursing credit. Um, and make sure that your email address that you enter in the evaluation is correct. A calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs can be found at our website, www.partnershipmch.org, under the Professional Education tab. We also offer on-demand recordings of many of our programs, which are listed there as well. We hope you can join us as we continue our series um, next week on the 17th we will have a lecture on are we going to pot and we've added a fourth lecture on the 25th opioid addiction and alternatives thank you for joining and have a great day thank you dr judith and th i just want to thank everyone for um, hanging out throughout the entire lecture asking such pertinent and interesting questions, and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you. Thank you.